was evolved and specialized not later than thousand million years ago, when planet was young and recently uninhabitable for any life forms or normal protoplasmic structure. Question arises when, where, and how development took place. Later, examining certain skeletal fragments of large land and marine saurians and primitive mammals, find singular local wounds or injuries to bony structure not attributable to any known predatory or carnivorous animal of any period. Of two sorts, straight, penetrant bores and apparently hacking incisions. One or two cases of cleanly severed bone. Not many specimens affected. Am sending to camp for electric torches. Will extend search area underground by hacking away stalactites. Still later, have found peculiar soapstone fragment about six inches across and an inch and a half thick, wholly unlike any visible local formation, greenish, but no evidences to place its period. Has curious smoothness and regularity, shaped like five-pointed star with tips broken off and signs of other cleavage at inward angles and in center of surface. Small, smooth depression in center of unbroken surface arouses much curiosity as to source and weathering, probably some freak of water action. Carol, with magnifier, thinks he can make out additional markings of geologic significance, groups of tiny dots in regular patterns. Dogs growing uneasy as we work, and seem to hate this soapstone. Must see if it has any peculiar odor. We'll report again when Mills gets back with light, and we start on underground area. 10.15 p.m. Important discovery. Orendorf and Watkins, working underground at 9.45 with light, found monstrous barrel-shaped fossil of wholly unknown nature, probably vegetable, unless overgrown specimen of unknown marine radiata. Tissue evidently preserved by mineral salts, tough as leather but astonishing flexibility retained in places. Marks of broken-off parts at ends and around sides, Six feet end to end, 3.5 feet central diameter, tapering to one foot at each end. Like a barrel with five bulging ridges in place of staves. Lateral breakages as of thinnish stalks are at equator in middle of these ridges. In furrows between ridges are curious growths. Combs or wings that fold up and spread out like fans, all greatly damaged but one which gives almost seven foot wing spread. Arrangement reminds one of certain monsters of primal myth, especially fabled elder things in Necronomicon. These wings seem to be membranous, stretched on framework of glandular tubing, apparent minute orifices in frame tubing at wing tips, ends of body shriveled, giving no clue to interior or to what has been broken off there. Must dissect when we get back to camp. Can't decide whether vegetable or animal. Many features obviously of almost incredible primitiveness have set all hands cutting stalactites and looking for further specimens. Additional scarred bones found, but these must wait. Having trouble with dogs. They can't endure the new specimen and would probably tear it to pieces if we didn't keep it at a distance from them. 11.30 p.m. Attention, Dyer, Pabody, Douglas. Matter of highest... I might say transcendent importance. Arkham must relay to Kingsport Head Station at once. Strange barrel growth is the Archean thing that left prints in rocks. Mills, Boudreaux, and Fowler discover cluster of thirteen more at underground point forty feet from aperture, mixed with curiously rounded and configured soapstone fragments smaller than one previously found, star shape but no marks of breakage except at some of the points. Of organic specimens, eight, apparently perfect with all appendages, have brought all to surface, leading off dogs to distance. They cannot stand the things. Give close attention to description and repeat back for accuracy. Papers must get this right. Objects are eight feet long all over. Six foot five ridged barrel torso, 3.5 feet central diameter, one foot end diameters. Dark gray, flexible and infinitely tough. Seven-foot membranous wings of same color, found folded, spread out of furrows between ridges. Wing framework tubular or glandular, of lighter gray, with orifices at wingtips. 
spread wings have serrated edge. Around equator, one at central apex of each of the five vertical stave-like ridges are five systems of light gray flexible arms or tentacles found tightly folded to torso but expansible to maximum length of over three feet. Like arms of primitive crinoid, single stalks three inches diameter branch after six inches into five substalks, each of which branches after eight inches into five small tapering tentacles or tendrils, giving each stalk a total of twenty-five tentacles. At top of torso, blunt bulbous neck of lighter gray with gill-like suggestions holds yellowish five-pointed starfish-shaped apparent head covered with three-inch wiry cilia of various prismatic colors. Head thick and puffy, about two feet point to point, with three-inch flexible yellowish tubes projecting from each point. Slit in exact center of top, probably breathing aperture. At end of each tube is spherical expansion, where yellowish membrane rolls back on handling to reveal glassy red-irised globe, evidently an eye. Five slightly longer reddish tubes start from inner angles of starfish-shaped head and end in sac-like swellings of same color, which upon pressure open to bell-shaped orifices two inches maximum diameter and lined with sharp white tooth-like projections, probable mouths. All these tubes, cilia, and points of starfish head found folded tightly down, tubes and points clinging to bulbous neck and torso, flexibility surprising despite vast toughness. At bottom of torso, rough but dissimilarly functioning counterparts of head arrangements exist. Bulbous, light gray pseudo-neck, without gill suggestions, holds greenish, five-pointed starfish arrangement. Tough, muscular arms, four feet long and tapering from seven inches diameter at base to about 2.5 at point. To each point is attached small end of a greenish, five-veined, membranous triangle, eight inches long and six wide at farther end. This is the paddle, fin, or pseudo-foot, which has made prints and rocks from a thousand million to fifty or sixty million years old. From inner angles of starfish arrangement project two-foot reddish tubes tapering from three inches diameter at base to one at tip. Orifices at tips. All these parts infinitely tough and leathery, but extremely flexible. Four-foot arms with paddles undoubtedly used for locomotion of some sort, marine or otherwise, when moved display suggestions of exaggerated muscularity. As found... All these projections tightly folded over pseudo-neck and end of torso corresponding to projections at other end. Cannot yet assign positively to animal or vegetable kingdom, but odds now favor animal. Probably represents incredibly advanced evolution of radiata without loss of certain primitive features. Echinoderm resemblance is unmistakable despite local contradictory evidences. Wing structure puzzles in view of probable marine habitat, but may have use in water navigation. Symmetry is curiously vegetable-like, suggesting vegetables essentially up-and-down structure rather than animals fore and aft structure. Fabulously early date of evolution, preceding even simplest Archean protozoa hitherto known, baffles all conjecture as to origin. Complete specimens have such uncanny resemblance to certain creatures of primal myth that suggestion of ancient existence outside Antarctic becomes inevitable. Dyer and Pobody have read Necronomicon and seen Clark Ashton Smith's nightmare paintings based on text and will understand when I speak of elder things supposed to have created all earth life as jest or mistake. Students have always thought conception formed from morbid imaginative treatment of very ancient tropical radiata. Also, like prehistoric folklore things Wilmarth has spoken of, Thulu cult, appendages, etc. Vast field of study opened, deposits probably of late Cretaceous or early Eocene period, judging from associated specimens, massive stalagmites deposited above them, hard work hewing out, but toughness prevented damage, State of preservation miraculous, evidently owing to limestone action. No more found so far, but will resume search later. Job now to get fourteen huge specimens to camp without dogs, which bark furiously and can't be trusted near them. With nine men, three left to guard the dogs, we ought to manage the three sledges fairly well, 
the wind is bad, must establish plane communication with McMurdo Sound and begin shipping material, but I've got to dissect one of these things before we take any rest. Wish I had a real laboratory here. Dyer better kick himself for having tried to stop my westward trip. First the world's greatest mountains, and then this. If this last isn't the high spot of the expedition, I don't know what is. We're made, scientifically. Congrats, Pabodi, on the drill that opened up the cave. Now, will Arkham please repeat description? The sensations of Pabodi and myself at receipt of this report were almost beyond description, nor were our companions much behind us in enthusiasm. McTighe, who had hastily translated a few high spots as they came from the droning receiver set, wrote out the entire message from his shorthand version as soon as Lake's operator signed off. All appreciated the epic-making significance of the discovery, and I sent Lake congratulations as soon as the Arkham's operator had repeated back the descriptive parts as requested, and my example was followed by Sherman from his station at the McMurdo Sound supply cache, as well as by Captain Douglas of the Arkham. Later, as head of the expedition, I added some remarks to be relayed through the Arkham to the outside world. Of course, rest was an absurd thought amidst this excitement, and my only wish was to get to Lake's camp as quickly as I could. It disappointed me when he sent word that a rising mountain gale had made early aerial travel impossible. But within an hour and a half, interest again rose to banish disappointment. Lake was sending more messages and told of the completely successful transportation of the fourteen great specimens to the camp. It had been a hard pull, for the things were surprisingly heavy, but nine men had accomplished it very neatly. Now some of the party were hurriedly building a snow corral at a safe distance from the camp, to which the dogs could be brought for convenience in feeding. The specimens were laid out on the hard snow near the camp, save for one on which Lake was making crude attempts at dissection. This dissection seemed to be a greater task than had been expected, for despite the heat of a gasoline stove in the newly raised laboratory tent, the deceptively flexible tissues of the chosen specimen, a powerful and intact one, lost nothing of their more than leathery toughness. Lake was puzzled as to how he might make the requisite incisions without violence destructive enough to upset all the structural niceties he was looking for. He had, it is true, seven more perfect specimens, but these were too few to use up recklessly unless the cave might later yield an unlimited supply. Accordingly, he removed the specimen and dragged in one which, though having remnants of the starfish arrangements at both ends, was badly crushed and partly disrupted along one of the great torso furrows. Results quickly reported over the wireless were baffling and provocative indeed. Nothing like delicacy or accuracy was possible with instruments hardly able to cut the anomalous tissue, but the little that was achieved left us all awed and bewildered. Existing biology would have to be wholly revised, for this thing was no product of any cell growth science knows about. There had been scarcely any mineral replacement, and despite an age of perhaps forty million years, the internal organs were wholly intact. The leathery, undeteriorative, and almost indestructible quality was an inherent attribute of the thing's form of organization and pertained to some paleogean cycle of invertebrate evolution utterly beyond our powers of speculation. At first all that Lake found was dry, but as the heated tent produced its thawing effect, organic moisture of pungent and offensive odor was encountered toward the thing's uninjured side. It was not blood, but a thick, dark green fluid apparently answering the same purpose. By the time Lake reached this stage, all thirty-seven dogs had been brought to the still uncompleted corral near the camp, and even at that distance set up a savage barking and show of restlessness at the acrid, diffusive smell. Far from helping to place the strange entity, this provisional dissection merely deepened its mystery. All guesses about its external members had been correct, and on the evidence of these one could hardly hesitate to call the thing animal, but internal inspection brought up so many vegetable evidences that Lake was left hopelessly at sea. It had digestion and circulation, and eliminated waste matter through the reddish tubes of its starfish-shaped base. Cursorily one would say that its respiratory apparatus handled oxygen rather than carbon dioxide, and there were odd evidences of air storage chambers and methods of shifting respiration from the external orifice to at least two other fully developed breathing systems, gills and pores. 
Clearly it was amphibian and probably adapted to long airless hibernation periods as well. Vocal organs seemed present in connection with the main respiratory system, but they presented anomalies beyond immediate solution. Articulate speech, in the sense of syllable utterance, seemed barely conceivable, but musical piping notes covering a wide range were highly probable. The muscular system was almost preternaturally developed. The nervous system was so complex and highly developed as to leave leg aghast. Though excessively primitive and archaic in some respects, the thing had a set of ganglial centers and connectives arguing the very extremes of specialized development. Its five-lobed brain was surprisingly advanced, and there were signs of a sensory equipment served in part through the wiry cilia of the head, involving factors alien to any other terrestrial organism. Probably it had more than five senses, so that its habits could not be predicted from any existing analogy. It must, Lake thought, have been a creature of keen sensitiveness and delicately differentiated functions in its primal world, much like the ants and bees of today. It reproduced like the vegetable cryptograms, especially the pteridophytes, having spore cases at the tips of the wings and evidently developing from a thallus or prothallus. But to give it a name at this stage was mere folly. It looked like a radiate, but it was clearly something more. It was partly vegetable, but had three-fourths of the essentials of animal structure. That it was marine in origin, its symmetrical contour and certain other attributes clearly indicated, yet one could not be exact as to the limit of its later adaptions. The wings, after all, held a persistent suggestion of the aerial. How it could have undergone its tremendously complex evolution on a newborn earth in time to leave prints in Archean rocks was so far beyond conception as to make Lake whimsically recall the primal myths about great old ones who filtered down from the stars and concocted earth life as a joke or mistake, and the wild tales of cosmic hill things from outside told by a folklorist colleague in Miskatonic's English department. Naturally, he considered the possibility of the Precambrian prints having been made by a less evolved ancestor of the present specimens, but quickly rejected this too-facile theory upon considering the advanced structural qualities of the older fossils. If anything, the later contours showed decadence rather than higher evolution. The size of the pseudo-feet had decreased, and the whole morphology seemed coarsened and simplified. Moreover, the nerves and organs just examined held singular suggestions of retrogression from forms still more complex. Atrophied and vestigial parts were surprisingly prevalent. Altogether, little could be said to have been solved, and Lake fell back on mythology for a provisional name, jocosely dubbing his finds the Elder Ones. At about 2.30 a.m., having decided to postpone further work and get a little rest, he covered the dissected organism with a tarpaulin, emerged from the laboratory tent, and studied the intact specimens with renewed interest. The ceaseless Antarctic sun had begun to limber up their tissues a trifle, so that the head points and tubes of two or three showed signs of unfolding, but Lake did not believe there was any danger of immediate decomposition in the almost sub-zero air. He did, however, move all the undissected specimens closer together and throw a spare tent over them in order to keep off the direct solar rays. That would also help to keep their possible scent away from the dogs, whose hostile unrest was really becoming a problem, even at their substantial distance and behind the higher and higher snow walls, which an increased quota of the men were hastening to raise around their quarters. He had to weight down the corners of the tent cloth with heavy blocks of snow to hold it in place amidst the rising gale, for the Titan mountains seemed about to deliver some gravely severe blasts. Early apprehensions about sudden Antarctic winds were revived, and under Atwood's supervision precautions were taken to bank the tents, new dog corral, and crude aeroplane shelters with snow on the mountainward side. These latter shelters, begun with hard snow blocks during odd moments, were by no means as high as they should have been, and Lake finally detached all hands from other tasks to work on them. It was after four when Lake at last prepared to sign off and advised us all to share the rest period his outfit would take when the shelter walls were a little higher. He held some friendly chat with Pobody over the ether and repeated his praise of the really marvelous drills that had helped him make his discovery. That would also send greetings and praises. I gave Lake a warm word of congratulation, owning up that he was right about the western trip 
and we all agreed to get in touch by wireless at ten in the morning. If the gale was then over, Lake would send a plane for the party at my base. Just before retiring, I dispatched a final message to the Arkham with instructions about toning down the day's news for the outside world, since the full details seemed radical enough to rouse a wave of incredulity until further substantiated. 3. None of us, I imagine, slept very heavily or continuously that morning, for both the excitement of Lake's discovery and the mounting fury of the wind were against such a thing. So savage was the blast, even where we were, that we could not help wondering how much worse it was at Lake's camp, directly under the vast unknown peaks that bred and delivered it. McTighe was awake at ten o'clock and tried to get Lake on the wireless, as agreed, but some electrical condition in the disturbed air to the westward seemed to prevent communication. We did, however, get the Arkham, and Douglas told me that he had likewise been vainly trying to reach Lake. He had not known about the wind, for very little was blowing at McMurdo Sound, despite its persistent rage where we were. Throughout the day we all listened anxiously and tried to get Lake at intervals, but invariably without results. About noon a positive frenzy of wind stampeded out of the west, causing us to fear for the safety of our camp, but it eventually died down, with only a moderate relapse at 2 p.m. After three o'clock it was very quiet, and we redoubled our efforts to get Lake. Reflecting that he had four planes, each provided with an excellent shortwave outfit, we could not imagine any ordinary accident capable of crippling all his wireless equipment at once. Nevertheless, the stony silence continued, and when we thought of the delirious force the wind must have had in his locality, we could not help making the most direful conjectures. By six o'clock our fears had become intense and definite, and after a wireless consultation with Douglas and Torfinson, I resolved to take steps toward investigation. The fifth aeroplane, which we had left at the McMurdo Sound supply cache with Sherman and two sailors, was in good shape and ready for instant use, and it seemed that the very emergency for which it had been saved was now upon us. I got Sherman by wireless and ordered him to join me with the plane and the two sailors at the southern base as quickly as possible, the air conditions being apparently highly favorable. We then talked over the personnel of the coming investigation party and decided that we would include all hands, together with the sledge and dogs which I had kept with me. Even so great a load would not be too much for one of the huge planes built to our especial orders for heavy machinery transportation. At intervals I still tried to reach Lake with the wireless, but all to no purpose. Sherman, with the sailors Gunnarsson and Larson, took off at 7.30 and reported a quiet flight from several points on the wing. They arrived at our base at midnight, and all hands at once discussed the next move. It was risky business sailing over the Antarctic in a single aeroplane without any line of bases, but no one drew back from what seemed like the plainest necessity. We turned in at two o'clock for a brief rest after some preliminary loading of the plane, but were up again in four hours to finish the loading and packing. At 7.15 a.m. January 25th, we started flying northwestward under McTighe's pilotage with ten men, seven dogs, a sledge, a fuel and food supply, and other items, including the plane's wireless outfit. The atmosphere was clear, fairly quiet and relatively mild in temperature, and we anticipated very little trouble in reaching the latitude and longitude designated by Lake as the site of his camp. Our apprehensions were over what we might find, or fail to find, at the end of our journey, for silence continued to answer all calls dispatched to the camp. Every incident of that four-and-a-half-hour flight is burned into my recollection because of its crucial position in my life. It marked my loss, at the age of fifty-four, of all that peace and balance which the normal mind possesses through its accustomed conception of external nature and nature's laws. Thenceforward the ten of us, but the student Danforth and myself above all others, were to face a hideously amplified world of lurking horrors which nothing can erase from our emotions, and which we would refrain from sharing with mankind in general if we could. The newspapers have printed the bulletins we sent from the moving plane, telling of our non-stop course, our two battles with treacherous upper-air gales, our glimpse of the broken surface where Lake had sunk his mid-journey shaft three days before, and our sight of a group of those strange fluffy snow cylinders noted by Amundsen and Bird as lolling in the wind across the endless leagues of frozen plateau. 
There came a point, though, when our sensations could not be conveyed in any words the press would understand, and a later point when we had to adopt an actual rule of strict censorship. The sailor Larson was first to spy the jagged line of witch-like cones and pinnacles ahead, and his shouts sent everyone to the windows of the great cabined plain. Despite our speed, they were very slow in gaining prominence, hence we knew that they must be infinitely far off and visible only because of their abnormal height. Little by little, however, they rose grimly into the western sky, allowing us to distinguish various bare, bleak, blackish summits, and to catch the curious sense of fantasy which they inspired as seen in the reddish Antarctic light against the provocative background of iridescent ice-dust clouds. In the whole spectacle there was a persistent, pervasive hint of stupendous secrecy and potential revelation, as if these stark, nightmare spires marked the pylons of a frightful gateway into forbidden spheres of dream and complex gulfs of remote time, space, and ultra-dimensionality. I could not help feeling that they were evil things, mountains of madness whose farther slopes looked out over some accursed ultimate abyss. That seething, half-luminous cloud background held ineffable suggestions of a vague, ethereal beyondness, far more than terrestrially spatial, and gave appalling reminders of the utter remoteness, separateness, desolation, and eon-long death of this untrodden and unfathomed astral world. It was young Danforth who drew our notice to the curious regularities of the higher mountain skyline, regularities like clinging fragments of perfect cubes, which Lake had mentioned in his messages, and which indeed justified his comparison with the dreamlike suggestions of primordial temple ruins on cloudy Asian mountaintops so subtly and strangely painted by Rurik. There was indeed something hauntingly Rurik-like about this whole unearthly continent of mountainous mystery. I had felt it in October when we first caught sight of Victoria Land, and I felt it afresh now. I felt, too, another wave of uneasy consciousness of Archean mythical resemblances, of how disturbingly this lethal realm corresponded to the evilly famed plateau of Leng in the primal writings. Pathologists have placed Leng in Central Asia, but the racial memory of man or of his predecessors is long, and it may well be that certain tales have come down from lands and mountains and temples of horror earlier than Asia and earlier than any human world we know. A few daring mystics have hinted at a pre-Pleistocene origin for the fragmentary Nakotic manuscripts, and have suggested that the devotees of Sathagwa were as alien to mankind as Sathagwa itself. Leng, wherever in space or time it might brood, was not a region I would care to be in or near. Nor did I relish the proximity of a world that had ever bred such ambiguous and Archean monstrosities as those Lake had just mentioned. At the moment I felt sorry that I had ever read the abhorred Necronomicon, or talked so much with that unpleasantly erudite folklorist Wilmarth at the university. This mood undoubtedly served to aggravate my reaction to the bizarre mirage which burst upon us from the increasingly opalescent zenith as we drew near the mountains and began to make out the cumulative undulations of the foothills. I had seen dozens of polar mirages during the preceding weeks, some of them quite as uncanny and fantastically vivid as the present sample. But this one had a wholly novel and obscure quality of menacing symbolism, and I shuddered as the seething labyrinth of fabulous walls and towers and minarets loomed out of the troubled ice vapors above our heads. The effect was that of a cyclopean city of no architecture known to man or to human imagination, with vast aggregations of night-black masonry embodying monstrous perversions of geometrical laws and attaining the most grotesque extremes of sinister bizarrery. There were truncated cones, sometimes terraced or fluted, surmounted by tall cylindrical shafts here and there bulbously enlarged and often capped with tiers of thinnish scalloped discs and strange, beetling, table-like constructions suggesting piles of multitudinous rectangular slabs or circular plates or five-pointed stars with each one overlapping the one beneath. There were composite cones and pyramids either alone or surmounting cylinders or cubes or flatter truncated cones and pyramids and occasional needle-like spires and curious clusters of five. 
All of these fibro structures seem knit together by tubular bridges crossing from one to the other at various dizzy heights, and the implied scale of the whole was terrifying and oppressive in its sheer giganticism. The general type of mirage was not unlike some of the wilder forms observed and drawn by the Arctic whaler Scoresby in 1820. But at this time and place, with those dark, unknown mountain peaks soaring stupendously ahead, that anomalous elder world discovery in our minds, and the pall of probable disaster enveloping the greater part of our expedition, we all seem to find in it a taint of latent malignity and infinitely evil portent. I was glad when the mirage began to break up, though in the process the various nightmare turrets and cones assumed distorted temporary forms of even vaster hideousness. As the whole illusion dissolved to churning opalescence, we began to look earthward again and saw that our journey's end was not far off. The unknown mountains ahead rose dizzyingly up like a fearsome rampart of giants, their curious regularities showing with startling clearness even without a field glass. We were over the lowest foothills now, and could see amidst the snow, ice, and bare patches of their main plateau a couple of darkish spots which we took to be Lake's camp and boring. The higher foothills shot up between five and six miles away, forming a range almost distinct from the terrifying line of more than Himalayan peaks beyond them. At length Ropes, the student who had relieved McTighe at the controls, began to head downward toward the left-hand dark spot whose size marked it as the camp. As he did so, McTighe sent out the last uncensored wireless message the world was to receive from our expedition. Everyone, of course, has read the brief and unsatisfying bulletins of the rest of our Antarctic sojourn. Some hours after our landing we sent a guarded report of the tragedy we found, and reluctantly announced the wiping out of the whole lake party by the frightful wind of the preceding day, or of the night before that. Eleven known dead, young Gedney missing. People pardoned our hazy lack of details through realization of the shock the sad event must have caused us, and believed us when we explained that the mangling action of the wind had rendered all eleven bodies unsuitable for transportation outside. Indeed, I flatter myself that even in the midst of our distress, utter bewilderment, and soul-clutching horror, we scarcely went beyond the truth in any specific instance. The tremendous significance lies in what we dared not tell, what I would not tell now but for the need of warning others off from nameless terrors. It is a fact that the wind had wrought dreadful havoc. Whether all could have lived through it, even without the other thing, is gravely open to doubt. The storm, with its fury of madly driven ice particles, must have been beyond anything our expedition had encountered before. One aeroplane shelter, all it seems had been left in a far too flimsy and inadequate state, was nearly pulverized, and the derrick at the distant boring was entirely shaken to pieces. The exposed metal of the grounded planes and drilling machinery was bruised into a high polish, and two of the small tents were flattened despite their snow banking. Wooden surfaces left out in the blast were pitted and denuded of paint, and all signs of tracks in the snow were completely obliterated. It is also true that we found none of the Archean biological objects in a condition to take outside as a whole. We did gather some minerals from a vast, tumbled pile, including several of the greenish soapstone fragments whose odd five-pointed rounding and faint patterns of grouped dots caused so many doubtful comparisons, and some fossil bones, among which were the most typical of the curiously injured specimens. None of the dogs survived, their hurriedly built snow enclosure near the camp being almost wholly destroyed. The wind may have done that, though the greater breakage on the side next to the camp, which was not the windward one, suggests an outward leap or break of the frantic beasts themselves. All three sledges were gone, and we have tried to explain that the wind may have blown them off into the unknown. The drill and ice-melting machinery at the boring were too badly damaged to warrant salvage, so we used them to choke up that subtly disturbing gateway to the past which Lake had blasted. We likewise left at the camp the two most shaken up of the planes, since our surviving party had only four real pilots, Sherman, Danforth, McTighe, and Ropes, in all, with Danforth in a poor nervous shape to navigate. We brought back all the books, scientific equipment, and other incidentals we could find, though much was rather unaccountably blown away. Spare tents and furs were either missing or badly out of condition. 
It was approximately 4 p.m. after wide plane cruising had forced us to give Gedney up for lost that we sent our guarded message to the Arkham for relaying, and I think we did well to keep it as calm and noncommittal as we succeeded in doing. The most we said about agitation concerned our dogs, whose frantic uneasiness near the biological specimens was to be expected from poor Lake's accounts. We did not mention, I think, their display of the same uneasiness when sniffing around the queer greenish soapstones and certain other objects in the disordered region, objects including scientific instruments, aeroplanes, and machinery both at the camp and at the boring, whose parts had been loosened, moved, or otherwise tampered with by winds that must have harbored singular curiosity and investigativeness. About the fourteen biological specimens we were pardonably indefinite. We said that the only ones we discovered were damaged, but that enough was left of them to prove Lake's description wholly and impressively accurate. It was hard work keeping our personal emotions out of this matter, and we did not mention numbers or say exactly how we had found those which we did find. We had by that time agreed not to transmit anything suggesting madness on the part of Lake's men, and it surely looked like madness to find six imperfect monstrosities carefully buried upright in nine-foot snow graves under five-pointed mounds punched over with groups of dots and patterns exactly like those on the queer, greenish soapstones dug up from Mesozoic or tertiary times. The eight perfect specimens mentioned by Lake seem to have been completely blown away. We were careful, too, about the public's general peace of mind, and Stanforth and I said little about that frightful trip over the mountains the next day. It was the fact that only a radically lightened plane could possibly cross a range of such height which mercifully limited that scouting tour to the two of us. On our return at 1 a.m., Danforth was close to hysterics, but kept an admirably stiff upper lip. It took no persuasion to make him promise not to show our sketches and the other things we brought away in our pockets, not to say anything more to the others than what we had agreed to relay outside, and to hide our camera films for private development later on. So that part of my present story will be as new to Pabodi, McTig, Ropes, Sherman, and the rest as it will be to the world in general. Indeed, Danforth is closer mouthed than I, for he saw, or thinks he saw, one thing he will not tell even me. As all know, our report included a tale of a hard ascent, a confirmation of Lake's opinion that the great peaks are of Archean slate and other very primal crumpled strata unchanged since at least middle Comanchean times, a conventional comment on the regularity of the clinging cube and rampart formations, a decision that the cave mouths indicated dissolved calcareous veins, a conjecture that certain slopes and passes would permit of the scaling and crossing of the entire range by seasoned mountaineers, and a remark that the mysterious other side holds a lofty and immense super-plateau as ancient and unchanging as the mountains themselves, twenty thousand feet in elevation, with grotesque rock formations protruding through a thin glacial layer and with low gradual foothills between the general plateau's surface and the sheer precipices of the highest peaks. This body of data is in every respect true so far as it goes, and it completely satisfied the men at the camp. We laid our absence of sixteen hours, a longer time than our announced flying, landing, reconnoitering, and rock-collecting program called for, to a long mythical spell of adverse wind conditions, and told truly of our landing on the farther foothills. Fortunately, our tale sounded realistic and prosaic enough not to tempt any of the others into emulating our flight. Had any tried to do that, I would have used every ounce of my persuasion to stop them, and I do not know what Danforth would have done. While we were gone, Pabody, Sherman, Ropes, McTighe, and Williamson had worked like beavers over Lake's two best planes, fitting them again for use despite the altogether unaccountable juggling of their operative mechanism. We decided to load all the planes the next morning and start back for our old base as soon as possible. Even though indirect, that was the safest way to work toward McMurdo Sound, for a straight-line flight across the most utterly unknown stretches of the eon-dead continent would involve many additional hazards. Further exploration was hardly feasible in view of our tragic decimation and the ruin of our drilling machinery, and the doubts and horrors around us, which we did not reveal, made us wish only to escape from this austral world of desolation and brooding madness as swiftly as we could. As the public knows, our return to the world was accomplished without further disasters. 
All planes reached the old base on the evening of the next day, January 27th, after a swift, non-stop flight, and on the 28th we made McMurdo sound in two laps, the one pause being very brief and occasioned by a faulty rudder and the furious wind over the ice shelf after we had cleared the great plateau. In five days more, the Arkham and Miskatonic, with all hands and equipment on board, were shaking clear of the thickening field ice and working up Ross Sea with the mocking mountains of Victoria Land looming westward against a troubled Antarctic sky and twisting the wind's wails into a wide-ranged musical piping which chilled my soul to the quick. <laughs> 